Okay. And now I get to call on a lawyer, Melissa Carter. I'm going to do brief introductions. The Lord does work in mysterious ways. I didn't mean what I said about the Supreme Court, Melissa. No. Mar Melissa is a member of the Emory Law Faculty and Executive Director of the Barton Child Law and Policy Center, and that's all I'm going to read today in the interest of time. But I've asked specifically for her to come because over the years, her organization has been on the forefront of issues with children. Uh, they were probably one of the most active groups in the juvenile justice reform. And I've asked Melissa basically to give us a background uh, of what we have done as respects foster care, the reforms that we have enacted, the reforms that we intend to enact as of January 1st. And uh, I think she can put a unique perspective on this, and we, and we really appreciate you taking the time to do this, particularly during a holiday week. So with that, you are on, Melissa. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for such a kind introduction and for the opportunity to present to you today. I regret that I couldn't have been here with you on the 12th when you met for the first time. I had other commitments that conflicted, um, but I have watched the videotape testimony, and so um, I have that by way of context. I appreciate your interest in this topic, and I look forward to spending at least the next few minutes with all of you talking a little bit about foster care and the specifics as it relates to Georgia's system. Um, I have been a participant in this system, a stakeholder, for a long time here in Georgia. I, previous to this position, served as your state's child advocate, um, helping to conduct the over of the child welfare system and it's that perspective that statewide systemic perspective that I hope to share with you today it is my position that large-scale reform is not what is needed at this time uh, for two particular reasons first the data that we'll review today on the system's performance do not point in that direction but rather suggest more surgical targeted strategic improvements are really what's called for Secondly, the system has been undergoing reform for more than a decade, and that's what you've asked me to talk about. And we continue to confront reform with some large-scale initiatives that will come into being even at the beginning of this new year. So whether you're focused on the child protective services, the front end of our system, as you hear a lot about in the media today, or the foster care system, which is more of the, the deep end behind um, the door system. Uh, at the end of the day, this is one system. It's one agency. It's one workforce. And my concern underlying my conclusion is very much about uh, the ability for us to overload and overtax the system with too many reform initiatives uh, being implemented and uh, pressures from those systems uh, imposed at the same time. So I've been asked to talk about this big topic of reform. I understand the materials, copies of the slides that I'll refer to are included in your materials. Uh, thank you, Donna, for that. Um, Donna. Um, thank you, Donna, for everything. Yeah, she's fantastic. She's been a great there, assistant. And remember, there are more women voters than men. We yeah. never lose sight of that. And some of us are lawyers, too. I guess. <laughs> we can't get carried away. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> Fair enough, you're in charge. Um, so I have been talking, and I will uh, do as, this as comprehensively as possible in the time that we have, but as you can imagine, it's quite a bit of amount of information. So please um, ask me your questions as we go. Um, I agree that context is really important, especially when you're talking about systemic change, and so I want to make a couple of um, points first and generally orient us to our state's child welfare system. First, like Florida, our child welfare system is considered to be state administered. Also, like Florida, there is a tremendous amount of local control around practice and resource allocation in our system, even though it is state administered. Um, moving forward. So secondly, we talk about a foster care system, but in reality, the vast majority of children who come to the attention of our child protection authorities are not brought into foster care. And I think that's good news, right? We want most of our children to remain at home with their families when it's safe for them to be there. And so even an update from the slide uh, information that you have presented here, more recent data from July 2012 to June of 2013, that period of time, shows closer to 58,000 reports of child abuse in Georgia and about 6,000 children who were removed and entered into our state protective custody as a result of those 58,000 reports. Now about half of those 6,000 children who entered our foster care system entered as a, uh, for reasons of neglect. And I think that those cases, unlike, again, the ones that have caught the attention of our media recently, um, deserve a little more compassion because it really is more reflective of uh, the impact and the intersection of more globalized poverty on the well-being of our state's children. So be, I just wanted to be aware of some of those contextual factors. Um, nevertheless, the remainder of the report, so more than 50,000 reports, result in services, uh, situations where services and supports are provided to children and families when the children remain in, in the home what we call intact or family preservation type services. 
Um, these are not necessarily the cases that we hear about, um, but it's my privilege to tell you today that DFACS and the private providers that DFACS contracts with help thousands of children and families every day in this state. Um, and so it's not as we often have been told the place where children go to die, which I've actually been told that about DFACS. We do have a public perception problem that I hope to use the time today to correct for you um, in talking about how our system is actually performing. Listen, before I forget, is there members for the media here? You rest your case. We got one over there, right? Okay, one. Okay. Um, and so, uh, to in terms of uh, where our uh, that work, that work of those providers and of our agency, reflects this widespread consensus that's very much grounded in our laws and in our sort of cultural norms that children should uh, be raised in families, that they should be kept in their own families if at all possible, that when it's not safe for a child to remain in the family, that foster care may be necessary, but even when it's necessary, it should be temporary and it's no substitute for a family. Um, and so we can all agree with the value proposition that you heard repeated several times at the last meeting, that all children deserve to grow up in safe, stable, and permanent families. Um, and our system does pretty well uh, in terms of that commitment. As you can see from the data provided here, our um, performance in this area, these numbers uh, have some variation, as you might expect, annually. Um, but the fact of the matter is the majority of children here, close to about 70%, who enter our foster care system ultimately exit to be reunified with their families or to be placed in permanent legal situations with relatives um, or other extended family members. As you can see here, about, like I said, 70% and then another 19% in Georgia exit to new families, legally created through adoption. Now, our system is directed to achieve these and other what we call permanency outcomes, um, as well as to ensure the safety and well-being of children in our foster care system. Those outcomes are established by federal law. There are a number of federal laws. Um, I provided the major ones for you there by name and the date of their enactment. Um, and those federal laws establish substantive mandates that direct how our system will operate here in Georgia. Um, and so in that way, our system is, is, has become highly federalized in that sense. And the way that the federal law um, imposes these mandates on the states is through a federal state cooperative funding arrangement whereby the states must demonstrate compliance with these laws through the state plan and also through state laws and agency policy as a condition of receiving the federal funding that we need to operate our foster care system. Now there are many examples of this. The permanency that we just reflected on in the last slide, the permanency outcomes of reunification and adoption and guardianship, et cetera, and their hierarchy, the order of preference statutorily, legally speaking, are created by federal law in this way, um, as are things like impositions on the state to perform um, and demonstrate reasonable efforts to uh, prevent removal of children, to reunify or to finalize other permanency, Similar mandates around keeping siblings together whenever it's safe and appropriate to do so, educational stability for children in foster care, frameworks for providing transition services to children who have to age out, et cetera, and I could go on. But there are numbers, and they all work in this similar kind of fashion, where the federal law sets the objective, um, it's conditioned on the state's receipt of funding, and that's how the state comes into compliance. You also heard about another example last time um, with respect to Florida's performance around every child every month, visitations by caseworkers. That's another example of a fairly recent uh, federal mandate um, that suggested that more frequent visits to children is a way to promote greater placement stability and permanency. And so all states by October uh, of 2011 had to demonstrate that 90% of children were being visited um, by a caseworker at least once a month, and most of those visits had to occur in the home of the child. Georgia also exceeds this standard of 90%. You also have heard a lot, I mean, as I mentioned, all of these laws are driven by con as conditions of the receipt of federal funding, and you've heard a lot about Title IV-E funding specifically. Um, Title IV-E of the Social Security Act is considered to be the primary, but it's not the only funding stream for uh, states' foster care systems. Now the incentive structure around this federal funding mechanism of 4E has come under criticism because it is directed towards substitute care as opposed to prevention or family preservation, again, keeping together families uh, with their children. Um, however, it's not exactly true that the state gets more money, the more children that it has in foster care. Um, the nuance for 4E funding comes in a pretty complex funding formula, so there are a lot of aspects of it. But it establishes that federal reimbursement to the state for the expenses of foster care for any given child turns on the child's eligibility. And a child is eligible in part if they're removed from a family who is eligible for 
um, AFDC, so that's Aid for Families with Dependent Children, which is the precursor to TANF, doesn't even exist anymore, um, as that standard was set by the state in 1996. And the standard's not adjusted for inflation. So we won't, I mean, this is a lot, um, but the result is this. Um, what happens in Georgia when you have such a low rate uh, and that that is a precondition, a prerequisite of a child becoming eligible for federal funding if they enter foster care, is that Georgia's pen what we call penetration rate is also relatively low. The penetration rate represents the percentage of children in out-of-home care for which the state receives Title IV-E federal reimbursement for their care and maintenance. Okay, so that's generally what a penetration rate is. Georgia's penetration rate is at 36%, roughly. So really, only about a third of all the children we have in foster care in Georgia are eligible to receive federal funding for their care and placement. Can I, I'm just going to ask you one question. Yes. Based upon what we've seen, and we have declining numbers of yes. children in foster care, based upon what you just said, I assume we get less dollars than we used to get and so the example that was given in the prior hearings by Rick and the other people that spoke was the better job we do, the less money we get. That, that, ha that, that premise hasn't changed. From, you're just saying that hasn't changed. That premise is true, but it's further refined by this idea of the child's eligibility. So regardless of the number of children we have in foster care, every one of those children to be to attract the federal funding for reimbursement of their care right. has to be eligible. And what I'm telling you is only, no matter what no, the No, only 36%. I get that. Yeah. But even with that being said, yes. the better job we do, the yes. basic premise is, the better job we do about eliminating the number of children in foster yes. care and have them going back to their families, yes. we get penalized under the present system. Not penalized, but the denominator. Uh, we don't, all right, let's put it this way. We don't get the money we would get if we put kids in foster care. Well, the denominator changes. I understand. So we okay. have, for example, and you'll see, and we'll talk in a minute, in 2000 we had 14,000 children in our right. foster care system. Roughly a third of those, by these measures, would attract federal funding. Understood. Currently, we have about 8,000 children in foster care. So the denominator changes. Still, only about a third of those children are I eligible understand. for federal funding. Okay. So that's correct. Um, and so, uh, Georgia, accordingly, so what really happens in Georgia is that our funding scheme, our financing for child welfare in Georgia, is kind of unique. Georgia and Utah are the only two states where this is true, that Title IV-E funding is actually our third revenue source in Georgia. Georgia's f child welfare system is predominantly funded through TANF, Temporary Aid for Needy Families. Second funding source is state dollars. The third funding source is Title IV-E. And it's my understanding, I'm not an expert in the Title IV-E waivers that were um, mentioned and that you might have some interest in for the state, but it's my understanding that that um, hierarchy of funding does create some challenge in the state for its pursuit of a 4E waiver. It's hard to leverage off of a third level um, revenue source, etc. Um, and so these three outcome areas are, just so you know how it continues to go, not only paid for by fate and state and federal funds, um, but they're operationalized through performance measures um, that are enforced through a number of avenues. There's lots of oversight over our system, particularly at the federal level, but the biggie is the Child and Family Services Review, referred to as the CFSR. That review is essentially a comprehensive audit of our child welfare system uh, to ensure that federal funds are being spent in accordance with federal statute, regulation, and policy, um, but it's also to measure the state's capacity for achieving positive outcomes for children and families. So it's about compliance, but it's also about the system's capacity. How often? Uh, it ha it's, we've had two in Georgia. The first round was in 2001, the second was in 2006. Um, we're expecting the third round, but the regulations, uh, that the rules that govern how it's um, conducted and the way that the performance measures are defined are under review at, at, by Congress. <laughs> um, and so what's, well, it's, the way it's currently structured is that the state's performance is evaluated across 23 items that are seven categorized eight. across seven outcome areas, eight and then there are seven ago. systemic factors. And that's just for you to know, to know that it's a pretty robust and rigorous evaluation in terms of the performance measures. Now, many would say that there are inadequacies in the way the measures are defined, which is why they're back under review. But that's where we are so far. So, and I wanted to introduce that to you because you heard about some of those measures uh, through the testimony last time, and the data that we'll continue to review will be largely in that context of the CFSR. That's the, uh, that's, that CFSR has really what's, what's been moving our system and every state child welfare system um, towards a more performance-based, outcome-driven system that can be evaluated and measured. So here uh, we are with a bit of a snapshot. 
Um, Georgia's foster care system has been reforming itself for about a decade, and as I talk, will talk about it, it is continuing to reform itself. The good news is that, at least from a data perspective, it appears to be working. Now, nothing that I'm about to say by way of the system's performance is meant to overlook the kinds of tragedies that right. we hear about in the news. And so I don't mean to say, suggest that I'm apologetic or in any way passive or accepting of those things. Um, but this is from an aggregate perspective, from a system health perspective. Um, as you can see, in 2004, about 12,000 children were removed into foster care. We had over 14,000 children in our foster care system, and that was the largest that our system had ever been. And in fact, children were not safer as a result of having that many children in care. We had a re-abuse rate, meaning that uh, a report of child abuse was received on a child within six months of the previous report. That's how we measure re-abuse. Um, it's a key measure of safety. At about six times today's rate. So we had more children in care and they weren't safer. Um, in 2012, as you can see here, um, the data indicates that throughout that time period, we've decreased removals by 49%, we've decreased the overall foster care population by 47%, and we've increased safety, as is evidenced in an 82% decrease in that reabuse rate. Where does this statistic come from? This is all um, federal data reported by our state agency. It's so this, this is what the agency reports? That's correct. So th we're taking this from the state? That's correct. This is a self-reporting mechanism, is what you This is a self-reporting mechanism along um, data elements that are defined and required by the federal by the government federal, okay. and that are comparable across other states. Okay. Do we audit those? Yes. We do. Yes, we, and we have lots of. We do advocate organizations like like us. That's or, what I'm asking. Yes. I'm just trying to see. Yeah. I'm trying. To, I sometimes I'm a little suspect after being sure. down here 15 years of state data. Sure, and I can appreciate that. Having been the child advocate, we looked a lot about you know data deficiencies, data omissions, data. You know, data. So it is being audited by yes. a lot of people. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, Casey Family Programs also assists okay. in this, That's for good. example, okay. others. Um, so this is what's known as Georgia's safe reduction strategy. You might hear about that, and that is an initiative of Casey Family Programs nationally. Um, and this is sort of the evidence of where we've been on that. From a national perspective, this is where those efforts position us today. Um, that from a perspective of the um, national rate for the number of children in foster care based on the population, we're at about wow. half of the national rate. As you can see, we're on the lowest end of this. Now that's fine and well, except that we have to make sure that children are also safe, safe. that we're not just pushing ch children out of our foster care system and keeping them out, but that we're, uh, we also have assurances of safety. Here's our assurance of safety from a data perspective, which is the six-month recurrence of maltreatment rate that I've already discussed. And as you can see from this slide, um, we do have some assurance of safety. Georgia is about half of the national rate for reabuse also. So let's unpack a little bit um, the stories behind these numbers so that we can understand what reforms have driven us and brought us to this place and maybe learn from those past um, efforts as well. We find ourselves in patterns, pendulum swing, we're in circular patterns, et cetera. All of that is very true. Um, and so where we find ourselves today in looking at more reform or um, the deficiencies, again, that have been highlighted lately, you find um, resonate with our history a little bit too. In 2000, uh, in 2000 and 2001, our system was very much in crisis. We did not know just a decade ago how many children were in our foster care system, and we certainly didn't know how well they were faring, either in the community or in our foster care system, in the state's protective custody. Um, a couple of high-profile cases, as you can see referenced here, Terrell Peterson, also the House of Prayer case, um, hit the news, and our system reacted, and that drove some reforms that I'll talk more about. He's no longer with us. Also, at this time, um, the, the first round of the CFSR, which I've mentioned, um, was conducted here in the state and identified a number of deficiencies that resulted in a corrective action plan and ultimately some penalties that were lodged against the state for practice performance issues, um, again, that drove some reforms. In 2002, we had the um, filing of the Kenny A class action lawsuit in Fulton and DeKalb counties. The consent decrees that have been issued from that lawsuit obviously guide reform. And in 2004, we had this interesting um, action at the time by the department that they adjusted their mandated reporter investigation policy. Uh, and I note that for you here because you can see the correlation from when that happened to what happened in data. Um, a number of high profile cases again had been, had hit the news. Our system tends to be very reactive to those things under pressure from the public and politically. Um, and what happened was we had a spike in the number of children who were removed and brought into foster care. That change um, is part of the story about what led to that height of uh, 14,000 children in our foster care system. 
and that that was a time at which um, we couldn't serve children well in our system and we, again we weren't discerning about which children were coming in and which weren't. And so we didn't have the sensitivity um, or the precision of a detection system in, in our child welfare system that we really needed. Um, and so in reaction to Terrell Peterson's death, you guys might, might remember this Time magazine cover. So Georgia's foster care system and the case of Terrell Peterson were so horrific um, that in fact we found ourselves on the cover of Time magazine and not with good news. And that case um, was a case in which a, a child who had come to the attention of DFACS numerous times, um, had had some severe and horrific things happening to him, had been courageous enough at the age of five to tell authorities what was going on and who was doing it, and he was still not removed into foster care, and he was not protected. He was ultimately killed by who was thought to be his paternal grandmother and a paternal aunt. Um, so great system deficiencies, um, gaps in all of our child protection network from DFACS certainly, but also including law enforcement. Um, there were hospital authorities also involved and others. We also had the House of Prayer case. You might remember uh, Pastor, uh, Al Pastor Allen, who was recently in the news again. This was a situation, it had been an ongoing situation where members of this church congregation would uh, publicly in front of the church congregation hold children sort of in a quartering kind of style and beat them physically. These kinds of cases are not normative at all. I would be careful to point out. But of course they drive reaction, understandably so, and outrage. And so in reaction to Terrell's death and also partly the House of Prayer, the governor at that time created a task force on child protection services. Um, also the Office of the Child Advocate was created for more system accountability and oversight. Uh, but that child protective services um, task force came through with a number of recommendations for system change, some of which were easily implemented, things like um, increasing the education requirements for caseworkers, requiring a more professionalized workforce, reducing caseloads. That's always a challenge, but that was at the time part of the attention. Other things are things that we're still seeing now. So this was a decade ago, and driving system change in a large, complex organization takes time. And so we see things like a recommendation at the time for a statewide, toll-free, um, Calling for Hotline. child abuse Hotline. intake. Yeah, and we're, st and we're still seeing that now. That's going to actually go um, statewide and live January 1st, which we'll talk about later. So those are things that have just taken a long time to develop and implement. Um, then, as I mentioned, in 2002, we had Kenny A. And you're, you might be very familiar with Kenny A. Those of us who work in this system certainly are. Kenny A was a class action lawsuit filed by Children's Rights, which is a litigation boutique out of New York on behalf of children in Fulton and DeKalb counties who were alleged or adjudicated deprived. So again, children who are in our foster care system and the work of this system implicates our courts as well. Or who have an open defects case. Um, that lawsuit, as you can see here, included 15 claims, both of federal and state law, uh, as well as constitutional claims. It's sort of, uh, the claims are generally oriented towards um, the deficiencies and the creating an unsafe foster care system and for providing ineffective and inadequate legal assistance for children who are in, um, in the class. And the deficiencies included th such things, there were numbers of them, but excessive caseloads, again, in insufficient numbers of foster homes, lack of supports and information provided to foster parents, failure to provide timely and appropriate permanency planning, so all of the uh, work that goes into figuring out how a child will be reunified or adopted, et cetera. Um, delays or denials of placements for children of minority races, which is a violation of federal law. Uh, placement in dangerous shelters. At the time, we had the Fulton and DeKalb Children's Shelters. And one of the most immediate and transformative results of Kenny A was the immediate closure of those oh, two shelters, yeah. which were at the time seen as very dangerous. So the current status of Kenny A, which is something that is, is still relevant in terms of reform today, the claims against the state defendants were settled through a consent decree in 2005. The state is still working to come into compliance with that um, consent decree. Nine years. The claims against Fulton County were settled um, in 2006, years. and the county was released from its um, oversight in 2011. Uh, likewise, claims in DeKalb County were settled in 2006, and they were released in 2008. But that state decree is still in place and driving a lot of the attention and resources um, of our system. Does this seem abnormal to you a little bit? It takes nine years, and it's still working on it? 
Um, yes and no. We see um, we see class action lawsuits, uh, particularly those driven by children. I'm not talking about the suit. Oh. I'm talking about you had a consent decree not five, not, almost nine years ago. Yeah, and we say. still haven't solved the problems a generation of kids later. So no, and and that's not a surprise. And I am talking that that's, about that's the why I'm asking the question. Also. We see consent decrees in other states operating for 20 and 25 years. Um, and so this is not a surprise. It has some to do with the rigorous measures. It also has to do with some of the, in my opinion, some of the way the measures are defined, which, in my opinion, need to be renegotiated because the state can't satisfy them okay. based on the way they're defined on the class. Other issues okay. around how that settlement is structured. Uh, we are doing better. I, sh I should actually absolutely note um, that it, the, the Mo this consent decree, of course, is monitored. There are reports that are released every s for every six months of review, um, and it does show uh, lots of improvement. And again, the county uh, pieces of that were settled, and so there's lots of improvement around right, the Right, I saw that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so also I want to um, sort of by way of summary of some of this stuff in terms of our system performance, again, bring you back to the CFSR and how this looks today. Um, this, these are the four permanency, what they call permanency composites, and so they're combinations of items that I talked about in the CFSR, 23 items, et cetera. They're combined so that you can look at them more on aggregate. Um, several measures contribute to each composite. These are the four permanency, out, uh, permanency composite measures, and they were referenced, I believe, by your panelists last time. Um, they are for timely reunification, adoption, the length of stay in foster care, and placement stability. Each of these speaks to both the outcome itself but also the timeliness of achieving these things. So Leave that up one second, would you? Because we don't have it in color, that's why I'm... Oh, absolutely, yeah, so and I'm gonna talk you through it. Absolutely, I didn't realize you didn't have it in color. Um, so timely reunification, for example, looks at of all the children discharged within a 12-month period that's under review, so everything's with reference to a 12-month period under review. With respect to timely reunification, we're looking at the percentage of kids who are reunified within 12 months. So again, the outcome of reunification, but also the timeliness of achieving that outcome, being 12 months is how it's measured. Um, and if you had it in color, it would be easier <laughs> to see. No, we got it. That's fine. Okay. That um, we're, Georgia essentially performs right at the national standard, which are these dotted lines that run horizontally, which are probably are hard for you to perceive. Um, but we operate right at the national standard. Um, adoption looks at, in the same kind of way, for all the children who are discharged during that period under review, what percent were discharged to a finalized adoption within 24 months. That's the national standard. We, um, we perform above the national standard with respect to adoption. The length of stay considers the median length of stay in months, measured in months, from the date of removal to the date of discharge. So date of, the entire time, the episode, the child is in foster care. Um, and again, our system and its laws are oriented towards not keeping children in foster care. It's supposed to be temporary, again. Um, we measure this along 24 months, and we, again, perform above the national standard with respect to the median lengths of stay in foster care. Uh, finally, placement stability, which was mentioned to you. That looks at the percentage of children in foster care who've experienced within that 12-month under review two or more changes in placement. That's considered unstable. And that has a lot to do with, as you can imagine, the discontinuity of care and um, across all domains. And so that's um, a bad thing. So we want to make sure that we do have placement stability. We do, we are below the national standard. You can see that here by the blue arrow running vertically shows you um, the difference there. We do perform under the, below the national standard here. There are a couple of theories about this. Most states who have um, a foster care population as low as ours have a lot of volatility around this measure and don't perform well generally, and for two reasons. One, um, the children who, we, who remain in our foster care system, given that we're very, we attempt to be very discerning about keeping children with families when we can, and for those children who come in, we move them out as quickly as we can back to family. The children who remain in our system tend to be much more difficult to serve, so they've had much more complex histories, they have higher behavioral and mental health needs, et cetera. So it's hard to find placements to meet their needs and keep them stable. They bounce around. Um, the other part of that, which is related, is that what we consider positive placement changes are counted against you. And by that, I mean a child who's in a more restrictive setting, like a group home, because they have higher needs. When they're stabilized, the idea would be to move them to a family-based setting. Right. Um, that is a placement change in absolute terms, even though it's positive. It's what we want to do, and it counts against you in this measure. And so understanding some of these measures helps us um, differentiate a bit about the meaningfulness of those data points. The other thing we don't seem to do well at is the timely reunification. Timely reunification, we're actually, we meet the, the national standard at timely reunification. Yeah, but we've, we seem to be oh, not doing, I'm talking about here in Georgia. Uh-huh. 
This, these are all Georgia. Even, even with my liberal arts degree, I can read going south. Uh-huh. And that timely reunification, we, we don't seem to be doing as well as we used to do. Is it uh, yeah, the rationale you, for that? Uh, you do see some volatility over time. Some of that is that you can see that's the height is in 2004. Keep in mind that's when we started to get more aggressive about, about moving children out of our system. And so we had more, you see, more okay. aggressive reunifications then. Um, so some of this is a function of that change okay. in denominator, both in profile and in number. But okay. yeah, it does fluctuate, absolutely. Okay. The trends okay. fluctuate. Thank you. Um, so in addition to seeing sort of system performance, one of the drivers and all of these outcomes that we've talked about are shared by our public sector, our DFACs, as well as all the providers that DFACs contracts with in our private sector. Um, something that you'll hear more about, I'm sure, from our providers who will testify is a lot around the performance-based contracting that has been instituted. And that's to make sure that the provider, private providers and the agency are on the same page with respect to achieving these outcomes that our system on the whole is measured by. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what that landscape looks like. Um, we have in Georgia 164 child caring institutions. Child caring institutions, or what you'll hear referred to as CCIs, um, are full-time uh, full uh, room board watchful oversight, but they're facility based. So this is more classically what you think of as a group home, where there are staff instead of families who right. care for children. Um, so you can see the capacity there. These are um, facilities of six or more children fall into this definition of CCI. That's one constituent of this private sector. The other is the child pla are, the, are the child placing agencies. The child placing agencies are agencies that place children for purposes of foster care or adoption, um, and they are family-based. So it's essentially you've got DFACs, foster homes that DFACs supervises and administers. You also have those administered and supervised by um, private agencies, um, like Families First, for example. Uh, we have, just by way of capacity, so, and this is by way of letting you know that our system has privatized to some extent currently. Um, we have, by way of capacity, about 1,700 foster homes in the CPAs. Those are, again, our family-based settings. About 1,700 compared with, we have about um, 6,000 DFACS foster homes. Um, there was a comment made, some conversation at the last hearing about retention within the DFACS foster homes. Um, there is some data around the average tenure of DFACS foster parents is about 10 and a half months, um, but they do have a 70% retention rate. Those who leave the system tend to close their own homes voluntarily because they've been successful at adopting the children who are in their care. You heard last time, and I would absolutely echo, that most of the children who are adopted out of our foster care system are adopted by their foster parents. So a lot of times we have foster parents who are receiving children into their home who might confront that decision to adopt the child, might courageously decide to do so, and then they realize that they need to tend to that family now, and so they close their home from a fostering perspective. Um, that's about 45% close their home due to adoption. Only about 3% report themselves that they close their homes due to burnout. Um, that's part of um, sort of some of the perception about defects foster homes. Oh, you have here what I just reported to you, <clears throat> excuse me, about the capacities of the child placing agencies in the private sector. I'm across the street. And here what I just reported to you about um, the dynamics and the capacity of DFACS foster homes. Here's just a quick slide um, about uh, some of the financials with respect to the private sector. Again, we have numbers there from a state fiscal year 12, 13, and those projected for 14. The top two categories for, again, CCIs as I've defined them and CPAs and the totals for those three years, that's really for that room board watchful oversight, the placement and care of children who are placed with private providers. Now DFACS also contracts with our private providers for a number of other kinds of services, a number of front end services, um, also assessments, and the kinds of things that we lump into like family preservation. So when children go home and we need to monitor that situation for a while, or we can keep children in the home with some supervision and, and oversight and supports, that all happens through the private sector um, partially as well. And so you have some financial information about how we're purchasing those uh, activities and those outcomes. And speaking of outcomes, and I know you will hear more about this today, all of this performance-based contracting is really geared towards giving us some metrics by which we can compare and assess the performance of uh, private providers. And so we have these performance-based placement, PBP grades, um, which I'll run through you with you, run through you with, uh, <laughs> quickly, <laughs> too many things going on. We'll go through them quickly together. Um, the CCIs that I mentioned here, which are our group homes, are facility-based 
placements. Um, you can see here over time um, a measure of improvement across, as you can see, the three quarters here. Um, in, uh, generally speaking. Um, you also have here the CPA, so again the family-based foster care setting showing an improvement over time. What you when, see... When you're, when you're putting those numbers yes. up, the ones that show from 17 to 10 to 9? Yes. Because again I'm going black and white up here. One more. Uh -huh. But the 9... Are those... Are those D's and F's, when I'm looking at those numbers, are those F's? What are those numbers? Yes, so the, the yeah, thank you, I forgot that you don't have this in color. The um, smaller bars there at the bottom are the D and F grades. The more, the larger bars um, that are colored here, sort of a greenish gray on the screen, are the grades A through C. So bear with me, you're telling me in the first quarter, 17% of these community-based homes. Yes are below average and failing. Yes. And now we're down in the third quarter to 9%. That's right. And I would ask you over a time frame where you've seen this, are we talking that it's 15% the average of these are D's and F's over a period of time? What, what are we talking about here? I mean that seems to be, you cut, you cut the, the DF rate in half uh -huh. from the first to the third quarter? Yes. Is this self-reported stuff, or who's doing this? So these are, and I'd love for the providers to provide you with some more detail about okay. this experience from their perspective, but there are a number of criteria that, and it's my understanding that the performance-based placement and the grading scheme and the um, evaluation tool okay. were developed in collaboration between the private providers and DFAC. Okay. And so there are a number of things that go into this overall grade um, with respect to the safety of the placements, how they've approved their foster homes, et cetera. Where do these numbers stack up? Do you know? Uh, in terms of other states? Yes. I don't know. Not every state has a perform performance-based contracting system, and not every state that has one sets up comparable schemes for evaluation. Okay. So it's not the apples-to-apples -apples, um, comparability is a little bit out of our reach. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. And this is still relatively new as well, and so these trends, again, I would just say, in terms of context, this is a relatively new look or way to look at our performance of our private providers. And so we'll know more as we have trends over time. Um, going back to where we left off, these are the data for the independent living and transitional living placements. Those are providers who provide specific kinds of um, services to the population of youth who are going to age out of our system at age 18. So these are all looked, uh, you know, directed towards the kinds of skills and abilities that you need to become self-sufficient as an adult because you're no longer um, within the legal custody of the state at age 18. So here you have, uh, again, from overall perspective, yeah. a relatively stable 29, 27% score in the A to C area. Um, you have the 43 to 45 to 55% in the D and F and some decline over time. So this is an area that does point to some need for attention, if not improvement in this area, at least in terms of the evaluation that we have here. Well, these are the kids that when they turn eight, 19, then we say, okay, you're on your own, here's 25 bucks and go enjoy your life, right? That's right. Now we have, um, we do have some, some extended services that our state provides, again, with um, federal support to children beyond age 18, and we can talk, we can have a conversation about okay. that some way, but um, for the most part, from a legal perspective, children are no longer in the custody of the state at age 18, and so we're no longer obligated to provide service to them uh, in, in an automatic and default kind of way. Um, it is. <coughs> excuse me. This is uh, another look at provider performance along some specific criteria. You see placement stability, which is the bar at the top. Again, with our child caring institutions, we see a high rate of placement stability over time, pretty consistent. That shouldn't be surprising, again, given that our CCIs are serving higher need kids who probably stay there and stay stable there um, for longer periods of time. Again, our goal would not be that um, all of our children remain in CCIs and then exit at age 18. We'd like for them to transition back to community placements, but sometimes their needs are such that this is the right setting for them um, for an extended period of time. So they remain stable there. That middle line um, is for general contacts, things like case manager contacts um, with the children uh, and their families. And so you can see then some upward trend in performance there. That bottom line, which may draw your attention as an area of concern, speaks to sibling contacts and how much and how well we're facilitating ongoing contact between siblings who have to be placed separately while in our foster care system. And there are laws that direct some of that. There is certainly sort of a human interest um, in maintaining sibling contacts and, and connection to family. 
Those were our CCIs. Here's the same data looking at child, uh, I'm sorry, slightly different data looking at child placing agencies. Just some select findings. Placement stability, again, remains very high. That's great news. Um, sibling contacts is there, again, at the bottom, an area for some attention. And the line in the middle is uh, around academic supports. And then finally, independent living and transitional living, as they've been categorized here, that top line going from 33 to 45 percent speaks to community connections. How well are we getting children communed, I'm sorry, connected with their community before they transition out? Academic supports is the one that declines from 24 percent to 18 percent. Um, and then the remaining one are a sort of life coaches and, and um, transitional living skills, which rises from 19 percent to 45 percent. Yes. Sure. Which number are you? Twelve. Okay. Go ahead, Dean. So there is no data before thirteen. I'm sorry. Before fiscal year thirteen, there's no data before. Uh, that. Not no, not that I'm aware of. So I think what happened, and again, I would ask the providers to to collaborate this from a historical perspective. The provider-based contracting or performance-based contracting essentially took effect in I'm going to say maybe 2011, but they because it was such a new. Uh, a new approach to how we looked at this and to the relationship between private providers and the public DFAX agency. Um, they kept it internal as in an internal collaborative way, not public, um, for a year while they kind of worked out the kinks. And so that brings us to the first available public data uh, where we are now. Okay. I think that's correct. It's my recollection. Um, so that's just a look at a little bit of um, private provider performance. I know that that was an area of interest. Um, I want to also talk about the juvenile code reform. This is, um, as we move forward here, so we've sort of looked at what happened historically. Some of those things are ongoing, like we talked about the statewide call-in number. Um, we looked at things that are happening now, particularly performance-based contracting um, and some of the other initiatives around safe reduction, for example. These are initiatives, large scale, that are about to take place and sort of hit, if you will, our system. Um, in a pretty systemic way. One is the juvenile code reform, House Bill 242, which you may be familiar with. Um, it certainly received a lot of attention. It received unanimous support um, out of the entire um, General Assembly body. And really what it's known for, though, it mostly is what it's been lauded for, are the reforms on the juvenile justice side. So by that I mean the delinquency side delinquency and thinking side. about those parallels to adult criminal justice reform and how we're keeping kids out of detention and the savings and better Treatment. outcomes exactly that we can realize from that. What may not be known um, as well is that this is actually a comprehensive overhaul of our entire juvenile code. The juvenile code relates to the court's jurisdiction over delinquency, certainly, but it also includes how the court operates with respect to dependency or abuse and neglect cases. So the, with respect to the juvenile code, those um, the mandates that apply to the agency as they present cases before the court and the legal oversight that applies to these cases is all addressed in House Bill 242 as well. Uh, the overarching themes of House Bill 242, again, are to do some reorganization and cleaning up so that we have some stylistic consistency. We develop a new organizational structure so that there are um, integrated, coherent articles. Okay. For example, Article 3 is all of the self-contained, is a self-contained of all the provisions that relate to dependency proceedings, and, as opposed to having them intermixed like we do in our current code. Substantive changes, again, some of them relate to the juvenile justice side, but particularly with reference to these cases, these abuse and neglect cases, the changes were made to reflect social science research, what we know about a child's sense of time and development, um, incorporate best practices collected from other states, obviously embody a consensus from a juvenile court practitioners and system stakeholders. You all deliberated this bill for three terms. Um, the bill was under development for seven years. And so it certainly had a wide amount of vetting um, and a lot of consensus built around its provisions, though it certainly not, that doesn't mean it's perfect um, or that it satisfies everyone. Um, and then also, it, particularly with reference to uh, our ch child abuse and neglect cases, substantive changes were made in order to make sure that our state laws comply with federal laws so that we optimize the federal funding that we talked about previously. We have to make sure that our state looks like the federal law in order to demonstrate compliance that gets us the money that we need. Um, so we have Article 1. I didn't provide all of the, you know, didn't extract for you the each specific provision that relates to reform in this area. What I generally want to leave you with is that Article 1, which are all the general provisions. Um, we have a whole new host of definitions. There are, I think, 76 of them total. Um, we hope that those definitions provide greater clarity so that there's more consistency in application of the law and therefore more reliable and predictable and consistent outcomes. Um, with respect to, again, these abuse and neglect cases, we define things like abuse 
and neglect, which um, may shock you that those were not statutorily defined before, and certainly we need that kind of guidance in our laws with respect to these cases. Article 1 also, you know, we saw some of the performance, some of the um, area, maybe maybe that indicates some need for improvement around the transitional and independent living skills for older youth. Um, Article 1, we also include a provision that extends the courts, juvenile court's jurisdiction to review the cases of children who are beyond age 18 who are receiving those independent living services. To have one more check and balance, perhaps, to make sure that those services are being provided consistently, not arbitrarily lost, um, it's, and that they're tailored to meet the individual needs of that youth. So we have some court oversight now that we didn't have before. Article 3 is our dependency article. Article 4 is our termination of parental rights articles. Um, as a general um, characterization of those changes, they uh, introduce procedural efficiencies that really are geared towards promoting timely and efficient resolution of cases. That's in the interest of the children who are involved right. and the families who are involved, but also in the interest of our state resources that are caught up in those cases. So we do a number of things. Um, you know, from a legal perspective, we clarify the child's representation um, needs. We um, provide for expedited hearings, so there's some accelerated hearings that happen to front end, front load um, the court's intervention. So again, to to increase the efficiency of decisions. Um, in termination of parental rights, they shorten timelines for parental failure to comply with services. Uh, and so you can move faster on, for example, terminating parental rights for those children and moving on to adoption in a timely fashion. And then finally, Article 5 is worth noting. Article 5 is the Children in Need of Services article. Um, article 5 in CHINS itself is a brand new paradigm for our state. It's a new way to look at and also intervene with children who are status offenders, so who are committing those offenses that only relate to a child's age, things like running away is a status offense, okay. things like um, drinking underage, being um, habitually disobedient also. We have these kids are also called unrulies. A lot of times, those kids traditionally have been managed through our juvenile justice process. They are subject to arrest and sometimes detention, for example. And we don't get good outcomes for them. We know that. So this is part of the overall reform and, and recalibration of our system. Uh, really, we know that these children, and a runaway is a great example, that those behaviors, though those need addressed, because these children tend to be older and they need to have their own behavior corrected and redirected, those behaviors are often rooted in family systems problems. Children who run away are running away from family conflict or sexual abuse or something else that may not be detected. And so the, the statutory scheme for CHINS allows for these um, types of cases to be managed at some level by DJJ through probation and other kinds of oversight if that's appropriate in the court's view. At other times these children may enter in foster care if we find some of those underlying um, child abuse and neglect issues and the child is unsafe at home then they would be uh, attended to in the same way we do um, our dependent children. And so potentially you may see an increase in case management burdens on DFACs as a result of the way that we will newly manage those, that cohort of kids. Okay. Uh, I want to quickly note, and in my closing time, some additional reforms that I didn't go into, but things that you should be aware out of. Uh, this goes back to the comment that some of these things may not be directly situated within our foster care system, but in as much as they apply pressures to the overall system, they are focusing attention and resources in a particular area. Uh, we'll have a statewide rollout of what's called the safety response system. Its first phase of a statewide rollout, I believe, is scheduled for February. This is the, uh, a new orientation for DFACS about how it approaches investigation and intake of cases and looks at safety and assesses safety, for example. Um, it's been under development for a very long time. Um, it's been, been being piloted in a couple of counties for the last year or so across the state so that they can learn from those uh, practices there and experiences there, and it's it getting scaled up at this point. So that's a big uh, initiative for the agency. Likewise, the statewide expansion of the finished. centralized intake call center, I've mentioned that a couple of times. Um, that's been under development. It's been operating as an after hours call center uh, for some time, and now that's getting scaled up to be statewide 24-7. Again, the idea is more consistent and reliable um, intake. We have a transition, as you know, to managed care for our children in foster care. That's big. That hits on January, January 1st. 1st and is right. requiring a significant amount of resources and personnel. Um, we have always uh, these drivers towards increased accountability and transparency of our system and also enhanced collaboration, particularly with external partners outside of the agency. And there are a number of things that fold into those objectives, um, but certainly, again, in light of the cases that we're seeing currently being discussed, those are areas uh, that are being attended to as well. Okay. Thank Ma you for your interest and patience. I'm happy to answer whatever yeah, questions you have. To the members.
particular questions? Senator Tate? Um, going back to the court decree um, of a decade ago, are there any exemptions to that? Because I, and I think everybody knows that my my um, love happens to be um, group homes, and the fact that we did a very good job in Georgia with group homes. Yes. Um, and and when I look at you know the model, I, I know the reason that group homes are not. Um, functioning as they did in the capacity they did um, 10 years ago was because of the court decree. Are there any exemptions in the law that allow us to use that as a more viable option? Um, because I believe that, yes, we want to have our children in homes, home settings if we can. We want them to be with their families if we can. But a lot of these cases that we're seeing now, they are with families. And, and they are not um, handling and dealing with the children in the manner they need to be dealt with. So going back to my original statement, are there any exemptions in the law that would allow us to continue using the previous model that we had to provide services beyond that year um, for those entities that were doing a good job with providing those services prior to the change in the law. So I think what you're referring to, and, and help me <coughs> clarify if, if I've got it wrong, with respect to the Kenny A consent decree, there were provisions in there that restricted the kinds of kids who could come into a group home setting. Mm -hmm. So children under the age of, I believe, eight, maybe 12, 12, 12 um, could not be placed in a group home setting. Um, likewise, we have capacity issues around the number of children who can be managed there. Um, so no, there are not exemptions within the consent decree itself, but what I want to say, it, so my general philosophy is the more robust and flexible array of services that we have, the better we are. So that's really about a capacity issue for the entire system. Um, I, and, and what you say is where we see it, which is around, placement is all about meeting the needs of the child. And so the greater range that we have, the greater flexibility that we have in those placement settings, the better, able we're, we're, better we're able to tailor that placement setting to the needs of this individual child, as opposed to doing so on a more categorical or broader classification basis. So I would agree with that totally, but the Kenny A consent decree, um, those provisions, uh, the ones that you're familiar with from the way they were in 2002 and five and the settlement continue to remain in, in place. Okay, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a couple of questions. Please do. Uh, the governor has indicated we're gonna put a lot more money into defects yes. going forward. Uh, I don't know the particular areas where he's gonna put it. Uh, I guess uh, at the appropriate time, we probably want to hear your comments on where we're going to put these resources. You know, I know it's a three-year plan, um, and I guess in, in listening to the testimony a couple of days, a couple of things come to mind, and, you, and I want you to think about them. You don't necessarily have to answer these okay. today, okay? Now, there's a method in my madness. Bear with me. I think the, it's obvious that the independent living thing, that we're not getting it done. Number one. Yeah. That's one that just sort of jumps out at you, if yeah. you will. Um, the other thing, based upon the uh, statistics that we've seen, that we're doing, a, we're doing a pretty good job overall. And I think we're going to hear that from the providers today. But uh, what else we can outsource that makes sense? You know, the percentage, of the defects purchases so many outside mm -hmm. services. But where is it better to have community-based services with them doing versus government doing it? Uh, think about that. The other thing is it, it really bothers me that the whole federal program, even that basic premise, even with the 36 percent and so on, that I can see why people are applying for these waivers, mm -hmm. that I think people like yourself and some of the people we're going to hear from in a minute can decide we can do a lot better job with resources if, if we can allocate them accordingly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, if you would, because I'm real good at getting other people to do the work, uh, is I'd like you to spend some time with Mr. Jackson, okay? And together, uh, you know, if we're going to be making some changes in this program going forward, as we, as we, as, and I hope we are, that we can come up with some things that make some sense to do on a short-term basis. And if we can, we're going to enact them next year, if we can do that, yeah. okay? And uh, you all understand this issue a lot better than, as well as I said for Horacina, I guess she deals with it every day, but, and, uh, and Horacina, you're welcome to participate in this, as well, or anybody can participate in this as well, but certainly you're here in Atlanta, it probably makes it easier, uh, that 
because I do think there's some areas that we can improve on. And, and, and I guess what I'd like to do when this is all said and done, I'd like to get our story out, unlike the page on page A1, okay, the one that's out there every other day or every other week now at this point in time, because that's not a true reflection of where we've been and where we've gone and where we're going on that's this right. thing. That's right. And I think, if, I think together between the private sector and government and the people in this room, start writing letters to the said, wait a minute. This isn't the world we all live in here, so let's get this straight. Now, I am concerned about some of these statistics. When I see numbers like 20%, I don't have to even look at the col which colors they are. I've got concern. That's too high. Yeah. We're talking about kids. Over 10% is too high for most of them. Over 5% probably for most people. That's not politics. That's just reality. So I'd like you to give it a lot of thought. I'd like you and, and, and Mr. Jackson over here to spend some time together, um, if you would. Because I do think together we can come up with some things that make this better. And I don't know, I think on behalf of the committee, um, you're great. And, 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 uh, and, and we appreciate the time you took and what you do. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your closing comments so much. I do think there are areas, when I talk about speci targeting specific areas for improvement around well-being, I think that that's a particular area and that would be inclusive of those older youth right. transitioning needs. Um, I also you know, look at the legislature as a really nice forum for accountability, and I think we can do more public reporting around these things so that we can change the narrative, which is my yeah. ultimate goal, too. Well, when you told me seven years to hear back from the feds and we haven't heard from them, some of us think that's probably a blessing, but we do need the oversight. We, okay? and, we, and, and that's not the only, I want to be clear. No, I know, I got that. I understood that. One, but right. It's not the only measure of oversight. But I think, too, we all, I hope that we can all appreciate our role as each of us in our different positions, our stewards of this system, um, and that I'd really like to do what we can to restore public confidence in a system that's not doing so bad. Okay. And, in fact, has improved a lot over time. And I hope that we can change the narrative, as you discussed, um, okay. in order to tell that story better. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you.